On this edition of Fly Fish, we return to Oregon's Deschutes River and rejoin guide John Schmiralio. We had to go back for seconds with John, this time to learn some of his special nymphing techniques for fishing the red sides of the Deschutes. Right. In our tying um, session, Jack tail. Dennis is joined by Gary LaFontaine. Together, they create Gary's intriguing Doesn't twist tail. nymph. Denny Rickards is an expert at fishing lakes and reservoirs. This is just one of many lessons you'll get from Denny. They're truly worth remembering if you want to catch more fish on lakes and reservoirs. The Deschutes River of Central Oregon is a fantastic trout fishery and known for its amazing salmon fly hatch. These monster bugs excite the dry fly enthusiast, especially those who have a little trouble seeing their presentation. Nothing can be more disappointing than to show up for the springtime salmon fly event and find that trout are not rising to the occasion. Now, John, now this is the time of year when, the, when, when you know, we have the salmon fly hatch on the Deschutes, uh -huh. but we're fishing with nymphs. Why is that? Well, the, we got a couple things to deal with. We got conditions. We got a bright, sunny day and, and sunlight, fish don't care for too much. Um, there's still a, a, a bit of a migration occurring right now. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, these bugs are going to be more available to the fish as the nymph, and a little bit easier meal, and they're going to feel safer staying down. We sent Al Herberholz of okay, Flyfish out right to join here, local here, guide sir. John Schmiralio. John has sure, the Deschutes Canyon Fly, fly Shop in Maupin, Oregon. On the other side of the river, he specializes in walk-in guiding left, and offers instructional right. trips for the Even beginner and, and the bank, expert. The His work was cut out for him, having to teach an old German like Al how to fish a new way. Yeah, I've got a, a golden stone, and that's a very effective nymph on this river. In fact, there's more golden stones on the Deschutes than salmon flies. Really? So, what's the percentage of, of uh, one to the other? Uh, probably out of 10 bugs, seven of them are going to be the golden stones. So how far out here do I need to wade? Not very far. Basically, uh, just about knee, de knee deep. Okay. Well, my knees are pretty short. Well, then that's actually better. The, the more you stay out of the deschutes, the more fish you'll catch. About how far down do I let this drift now? All the way. You want it to drift as far as it'll... As, if you can continue the drift, let it go, because when the bugs get knocked off, they uh, off the bottom, or if they get become active and they get swooshed away by the current, they'll tumble for quite a few yards before they actually reattach themselves. Also, the fish will follow the fly around, and if you notice it, if they notice it going up toward the bank, uh, sometimes they'll grab it, thinking that it, it is a stonefly crawling out. Okay, and you say to mend it downstream first, and right? Then look where you're going to cast first, and then just throw your thumb to it. Perfect. You can fish all day like this and not get tired. Oh yeah, I mean it, it conserves energy and it's it's so much more effective. You know how many guys come into the store and they're wet all the way up to their label yeah. of their waders and they're saying they're not catching fish? And I say, well, for starters, you're standing on them. I could just tell by the watermarks on your waders that you're out you're out too far. Al, uh, yes. When fishing slow, you move fast. So I think we need to kind of cover some more water here, even though this is, this is a pretty sweet spot. Okay, uh, we're just right up here, do you think? Or? Yeah, jump ahead. There's a little break up there, and then there's some good breaks up above there. So we'll hit those and see if we can get some interest. Okay. All righty. There we go. Don't go out there. Come on back here. You got heavy current like this, you want to try and keep as short a line as possible. Boy. <laughs> He's putting a lot of pressure on me now. That looks like a pretty good sized fish there, John. <laughs> yeah. Boy, he's in heavy current here and uh Can I give you a hand? hand there? Well I might need your help, I'll let you know. Oh, what a beautiful fish. Okay, now another little tip about landing fish like this, when you're knee deep in water, keep your knees together because the trout will take off and go between your knees and that can be a real exciting situation it's for... It's kind of like flossing. Oh, yeah. There's a typical Deschutes red side for you. That is just a 
beautiful fish. So pretty. Look at the spots on that fish. I like to hold these fish upside down because it stabilizes them. They don't, they don't panic so much. Now, why, why does that work? They just seem to kind of relax. They don't, uh, they're not accustomed to being upside down, so they, they freeze. But as soon as you turn them right side up, and there <laughs> you go. What a beautiful fish. Of course, they did the old tail flick. They always, you know, want to wow. baptize you a little bit. Now, this fly is just a smaller little pheasant tail. It's got mm. a little bit of a soft hackle to it, and then just a little bead. Pheasant tails are, are typically have that reddish brown look right. that the pale morning duns have. And it's amazing that uh, the fish would take that little tiny fly over a nice big offering. You know, I always thought giving him a Snickers bar would be better. Right. <laughs> Remember, Al, there's obviously more of an abundance of these bugs in the water and more available to the fish, so they're going to key in on that. Uh, as, as big as this beautiful black and golden and brown stones that we fish, if there's not as many of them as these, they're going to take these. Don't be afraid to switch, and don't be afraid to fish small. Well, I think I'm going to switch right now. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and um, typically you find, oh, look at that. Yeah, like this guy here. Now see, he's in shade. Oh, yeah. And he's going to pick off an occasional. Now stay back, they're pretty spooky. But this is great vantage he's point. Just, he's just right there, he's right? right off that stick. He, he he's no more be... than a foot off the bank. No. But the spot we're going to go to, uh, it's a little bit more broken. It comes over with some rocks and the current swirls around and, and they hang a little deeper and wait for the food to peel off. So well, let's go. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so this is the spot here. And, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that looks pretty awesome. It's a great spot. And again, you know, the sun's high. You got a deep spot. This makes them feel safe. Uh -huh. You got a break up above. You got a lot of boulders and, and things to break the current up and, and a lot of foam lines and seams are forming and that's where a lot of food gets trapped. How do you know what to look for? If you get out of your vehicle and just walk the bank a little bit and head for the trees, you will find areas that... Uh, so trees are a key for what we're looking? Trees is, it, fish always enjoy the trees because it provides cover. Look at the cover. Yeah. Now, trees always turn fly fishermen off and, and fly. Well, I would have driven ladies. right by this. Yeah, and because it's like, oh, geez, it's too heavy a cover. I'm never going to get a cast in there. Now, with that technique that you showed me earlier today, where mm -hmm. I let the line drift down and then just kind of, I keep it out over the water. There's no false casting. You just right. kind of just flick it right up. It's just, just a rod lob. Yeah. It's extremely effective. And again, if you're fishing nymphs and wet flies, there's no need to false cast. Yeah. Oh, golly, be ready. Don't set it too hard. There you go. Oh! Okay, oh, that's line on the a, oh, look at that. That is just a wonderful, wonderful fish. John, you are a magician. Oh, no, it's, I'm not the one on the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> no, the fish is. <laughs> yeah. It's a beaut. Okay, let's see if I can coax him up here. Now, if he bolts, I'm just going to let go, and it's, he's on your leader. But I can't believe the strength of these fish. They're just, I mean, they're, they're so deep and That's broad. The river and these fish are um, typically, okay, a little bit of a... Oh, look at them. So, that is, That's a pretty good size one there. That's a very nice fish. I mean, there's just, look how deep he is. Nice and beautifully spotted. Now, I'm going to turn him right side up again, and he's going to wake up and go home. And he's what? fine. No problem. Again, smaller sometimes is better. Gary LaFontaine and Jack Dennis have joined up on a lot of adventures in their professional fly fishing careers. This time, we asked them to test their friendship by sharing the bench. We're going to be tying one of Gary's uh, patterns here. The creation they're taking on today is called the Twist Nymph. It's intended to simulate an emerging fly. Am I supposed to take my glasses off so I don't see it? So it'll be ugly enough. You're, you're too good a tire to actually be tying this. My flies have to be fairly ugly. All right, um, we're going to have a split tail of two pieces of uh, pheasant tail. You look at mayfly nymphs, they're alive. They have movement. They have translucency. They have the gills, the tails, the legs all of that moving. And you don't want to have to imitate all those individual parts. You just want to get the essence of life. You now tie in the longest piece of pheasant tail hurled that you can find. Doesn't take much to make a great fly. You want it on the tip? Nope, I want you tied in by the base. 
by the base. Okay. Never by the tip on a, on a twist because it'll break it. I'm bringing the thread right back. Okay, to okay, hold the it, table. hold it, hold it, Jack. I actually messed you up a little bit already. Uh, we don't want a black thread, and I'll explain why in a moment. We want a fairly light colored thread. A yellow would uh, certainly no, be great. No All right, now I want you to take uh, BT's um, wax. BT's wax, okay. It's right there, right, right, right there. In front of me. Yep. And what this is a BT. very tacky wax. Right, super tacky. Yeah, super tacky, and run it on the thread. You're now going to take yellow touch dubbing. We're going to use a, a real special technique called double magic. We're going to combine the magic of pheasant tail hurl and the magic of antra. And this is the only technique to do that. To do it, you need to touch dub. You cannot dub any other way. You're going to just touch, use your tacky wax, and you touch to the thread. Your touch dubbing is going to be a little bit shorter than the piece of pheasant tail hurl. It's not going to be longer than the pheasant tail hurl, just a little bit shorter. And you pick off a few clumps. Now, make a dubbing loop. The dubbing loop has to be a little bit shorter than the piece of pheasant tail hurl. Okay, perfect length. Now you want to grab all that. Uh, you can use a dubbing tool, a loop tool. You can use uh, a hackle pliers. And now you have to twist all that together. Ooh, real nice. That looks great, Gary. That's, yep. the, that's the double magic. You get, all right, now we're and it's, wrap it. it's not a rib. You end up with the antron coming out an aura around the pheasant tail hurl. Now this is your abdomen, so wrap it about three quarters of the way up. Okay, now we're going to have to tie in a wing case, case, and for that we're going to use six pieces of pheasant tail hurl. The touch dub with the olive right. instead of the yellow. Now you just wrap that as okay. your thorax. Okay. Now take your, your wing case, your fe yeah. uh, pheasant tail hurl, yeah. tie it off. I'm pulling it forward, tying it off. All right, you want to wrap under the right. hurl a couple times. Right. We're not going to trim this off perfectly flush. You're going to leave a little you're going to leave the stubs hanging out over sure. the eye. Now whip finish it and you got the pheasant tail twisting. Denny Rickards is an expert at fishing lakes and reservoirs. This is just one of many lessons you'll get from Denny. They're truly worth remembering if you want to catch more fish on lakes and reservoirs on this edition of Fly Fish. What I consider the most important thing for you folks to look at when we're talking about flies has to do with making sure that your fly is suggestive looking, has movement in the bottom of the tail, and to get that movement, I'm talking about this part right here, folks. As long as your flies are breathing and moving and showing motion, it shows that the fly has life. Trout don't eat dead things, they eat live things. In the middle of this body, this is what I call a seal bugger, and it's tied with seal's fur. It's got four individual turns of hackle in there, and what I'm getting in this fly is movement in the middle on the body, the tail's doing this, and the fly's weighted right here at the head. And I put 20 wraps of O2O wire, and the reason for that, it's not how much wire I use on the fly body, it's where I place it. By placing the weight right here, we get this indulating motion up and down, up and down. And when you pause in your retrieve, the fly's gonna drop. When you pull forward on your retrieve, it comes back up. And you can't help but get a real realistic aspect from this. This is what I call a seal bugger. And I find this one of the deadliest flies no matter where I fish in the country, whether it's in this country or other countries. Early in the season, late in the season, early in the day, late in the day, this fly is always mimicking something that's lifelike out there. And maybe that's why it's so suggestive. It's going to look like a dragonfly nip, it's going to look like a leech, and certainly at times it looks like other small fish. But the important thing to remember about this fly, or if you fish with woolly buggers or leeches, remember that all of those flies should be pulled parallel in the water. And again, that's why I use the intermediate line. If you have faster sinking lines, the key to it is not to bring it up in this manner. That's what you do if you use those. Uh, a floating line or a sink tip line, use your full sinking lines because all of those make your flies move in this manner and that's what this fly is designed to do. A second pattern that I use a lot out on lakes is what I call a stillwater nymph and a stillwater nymph to me during the summer months is probably the most deadliest fly I've ever used and it looks like this. It's nothing but a little green fly tied similar to a damsel and it also looks like a scud. If you guys like to fish scuds on lakes, Remember that when the, the female scud gets pregnant, its belly sac turns orange. And right underneath this area, right in here, I've tied it with an orange hackle. And what that hackle imitates is the brood sac 
on a, on a scud. So I'm imitating not one thing, but two things when I fish this fly in the water. It's going to look just like a scud, and it's going to look like a damsel. Most of the flies that we find in a lot of our uh, books tell us that if you're imitating a damsel, you put a short marabou tail and a long body and a big thorax and two buggy eyes. Well, folks, damsels don't look like that. Yes, they catch fish, but damsels have long tails, not short ones. And they've got short bodies, not long bodies. And what I try to do here again is bring in the motion and suggestiveness to this fly. I've got long tails to give me this kind of movement and very suggestive looking as far as the body itself. So this fly to me imitates a lot of different things in lakes, but primarily a scud and a damsel. This is what I call an AP. And this fly is tied to simulate water boatmen, any emerging mayfly, caddis. Sometimes uh, they'll even take it as a damsel. This fly imitates a lot of different things that you find in the water out there that trout eat. It's very suggestive looking, and this fly should be fished either with a floating line or an intermediate line. Short little pulls just to make the fly give you this. I don't weight it, but still, the fly has a lot of suggestiveness to it. And remember, what we're trying to do is not imitate one thing, but several different things when we fish it. Another fly that I find is very effective on lakes is what I call my calabatus nymph. Now, all these flies that I'm talking about this afternoon, folks, and I don't mean to tell you that you can't go out and catch fish with them, because they're all deadly. It's just that in 25 years of fishing lakes, I find that these patterns, they're just flies that I've created over the years that I find mimic not one, but a lot of different things in water. And when we think about feeding behavior from trout, remember this point right here. Trout feed in one of two ways. They're either going to feed suggestively, which means they're going to be looking for something that Im that's imitated by size, shape, and color, or a particular form of insect. When the fish are feeding in that manner, they may be suggestive, but how many times have you gone out and used a fly that doesn't even resemble what they're eating and still get strikes? That's the important thing to remember. And what does that tell you? That means that they're also feeding opportunistically. Opportunistic feeding trout means that they'll take anything that you fish put in front of them so long as it looks and acts lifelike. And they feed opportunistically 90% of the time. And they only feed suggestively about 10% of the time. I am not a proponent for matching the fly exactly as, as the insect looks, because I'm never quite sure what the trout will take it for. So when I'm using these flies, I don't care how they eat it, just so they eat it. So I want them to imitate not one thing, but a lot of different things. How does that work? You can change what the trout take it for, depending on what retrieve you use and what line you use. Okay, those are the important things to remember. It's not so much pattern selection, but what we do with it when it's in the water. So with patterns, let me summarize by putting it in this way. Make sure that you have flies that show lots of motion, lifelikeness in the body, and suggestive. Not to imitate one thing, but a lot of different things. And when you do that, these patterns that I have right here work for me all over the world. When we're talking presentation, we're talking about some of the things that we do that are erroneous or wrong versus the things that make that, that type of action bring it to life, OK? When we make our cast and we put that fly out in the water, no matter how good a caster you might be, when that fly comes down, we're always going to have some slack in our line. So what we need to do is to pull that line tight right away so that we can begin our retrieve. I see a lot of folks make a cast, and there might be some slack in their line, and they'll begin to, their retrieve right away. But they're really not moving the fly, not until the line gets tight. And the problem with it is many times a fish will come up, and they'll eat that fly, and you're not ready for it. So make sure your line is tight when you start your pull. When that line is tight now, no matter what happens, I can feel that bite. No matter what's going to take place on the other end, as I retrieve like this, if he comes up and just sucks it in, I'll feel it. So you need to keep the tip down in the water to get the line tight. And that's an absolute critical aspect of still water fly fishing. Doesn't make any difference if you're in a boat fishing from shore or in an inner tube, in your float tubes. All done the same way. Tip down, get the line tight so you feel that take. Now when you guys want to set that hook, you raise it up, you won't miss very many fish. This is just one of many lessons you'll get from Denny. They're truly worth remembering if you want to catch more fish on lakes and reservoirs.